We know that MFA presents so many attacks in Entra ID, but it's not perfect. And there's a bunch of misconfigurations and mistakes that you could be making that are putting you at risk, or maybe you're just not getting the best results. So in this video, we're going to look at five mistakes and misunderstandings about Entra ID MFA that ThreatGate commonly see in tenant security reviews. All right, first mistake that we're going to look at is two different types of forcing your users to actually sign up for MFA in the first place. Let's uh, head into the Entra Admin Center. And we're going to go on our left here. I'm going to start with the first method. And we'll explain the two different methods because it's a common mistake that folks don't understand. There's two different methods. We're going to head to Identity Protection. And then we get this option here for Multi-Factor Authentication Registration Policy. You'll see here, my current tenant has this disabled. And otherwise, it's scoped to all users. So I just need to enable this and it's going to force this on all my users. This policy is only applicable if those users have that Entra P2 or Microsoft 365 E5 level of licensing. And the clue about what this does is kind of in the name, multi-factor authentication registration. It's going to basically force my users to sign up for ID MFA of any type that is supported in my tenant. And that's going to be important, so pay attention. And it's going to allow them basically to snooze it for 14 days. So you get two weeks to register for MFA if you're a new user. Then after that, we're going to force you to do it. So this is one way. There's a second way. And the terminology is very similar. And so it can get confusing. We're going to leave identity protection now. So we're going to escape the realms of that Entra P2 level license. And we're going to go to a feature now that doesn't require any specific level of licensing. Let's find that. We're going to head on the left-hand side here. Uh, I think we're going to stay in protection. We're going to go down to authentication methods and we're going to go to the registration campaign. So again, terminology gets really confusing here. Previously, we looked at registration policy and we're looking at registration campaign. This is slightly different because number one, it doesn't have that licensing requirement. But number two, this is strictly related at the minute to the Microsoft Authenticator app. So for example, that last method we looked at, that would force SMS MFA if that's all I supported. Basically, one is focusing on MFA in general. This one we're looking at, this is focusing on this Authenticator app specifically. That might be useful because it gives us a little bit of a finer degree of control. So for example, if we look at the days allowed to snooze, well, I can control that. I can actually control the number of times a user is allowed to snooze as well. There's an upper limit of three. You just basically enable or disable that. And then we can also exclude or include groups similar to the last policy. But the mistake here is not understanding these differences and these intricacies. Specifically, that one is limited in scope just to the Authenticator app, but one requires any type of MFA. So that's called mistake number one for MFA. Mistake number two that we're going to cover here is not preparing for the move to what's called authentication methods. Let's uh, check that out. So we're going to stay in the same page in Enter ID Admin Center. That's protection, authentication methods. And we're going to head to this policy section up the top here. You will notice that we have an impending deadline of 30th of September, 2025. What this means is this authentication methods page that I see here, on that deadline, it is going to supersede what was previously called per user MFA or service level settings. Now you may be familiar with that and let me show you why. I'm going to open a new tab here. I'll go to admin.microsoft.com. We'll zoom that in. We're going to head to view our active users and we're going to hit this button here for multi-factor authentication. I'll re-authenticate. Now this used to take us to a page that looked like it hadn't been updated for about 10 years. Now it's in the Entra Admin Center, which is nice. We're going to head to service settings and this is what will be superseded by a more modern version in September, 2025. Why is this happening? You'll notice as I scroll down this list of all my options, trusted IPs, the types of MFA that my users are allowed to register, the validity of tokens when it remembers MFA. These are basically tenant wide. There's no nuance, there's no scoping, it's just very broad. And so what this means is for example, in this page, if this was all I had, and I said, yeah, I'm gonna let folks uh, do text messages for MFA, it would mean that's tenant wide and I couldn't have higher levels of protection or specific sensitive users. It would also mean that I would have to manage self-service password reset completely separately. If we head back to that first tab that we were on, we'll jump back. this authentication methods page, this gives us fine grained control over each of the individual methods. So we don't have to say the whole tenant gets it. We could say these specific groups of users get it. So it gives us a little bit more power and control over our environment, which we like. One of the really cool things is you won't be forced into this until that September date, but you can get ready and you can actually go through a migration process. Let's uh, 
Let's check that out. So for example, in this tenant, we can see that it's in progress. I can choose to begin the automated guide. This doesn't exist to begin with, but it's very impressive. And we'll hit next over here. And what it's going to do is it's going to kind of hold my hand through the process of moving away from those service settings into the authentication methods option. You'll see that it rank orders the different types of MFA based on, I guess you could say, the generic level of security that they might provide. So for example, SMS and voice call, as you'd expect, they rank near the bottom. Fish resistant authentication, such as passkeys, that ranks up the top. This will allow me to choose, hey, do I want to apply that to all users? Do I maybe want to limit it to specific groups? And then I can migrate over to this page here. Could do it manually if I wanted, but this new uh, settings migration wizard gives me a lot more control and makes that nice and easy for me. So prepare for that. And a common mistake that we see folks making is just not being aware that this is kind of impending and you want to get ahead of that curve. Mistake number three that we're going to cover for intra MFA is being aware and just double checking that a setting is enabled and that's going to be called system preferred MFA. Let's find that. So we're going to stay in the intra admin center. I'm going to head back to authentication methods. I'll head to settings. And then if we head over here, we will see this value called system preferred multi-factor authentication. Bit of a mouthful. In this tenant, it's disabled. I believe the default now is to be Microsoft Manage. And that basically means that when Microsoft thinks this is ready and you're good for it, it'll be enabled. Now you can opt out of it, but we're going to cover why you shouldn't. The most likely thing you should be doing is going to enabled. But let me explain why. In the good old days, Entra ID would remember the last type of MFA a user used. And when they need to do MFA again, it's just going to require that type of MFA. One of the problems that may arise from that is, let's say I've got a FIDO2 security key registered. I've got the Authenticator app registered. And I've got a text message phone number registered for SMS. If I chose SMS in that scenario, it would just keep defaulting to that, right? Which is a weaker degree of protection than fish resistant authentication with my FIDO2 key. With system preferred multi-factor authentication, it's going to review that user account, say what's the most secure type of MFA that you've got registered, and we're going to default to that whenever MFA is required. So Microsoft Manage is maybe the conservative option you could choose. In most cases, you could go away to enable this, or at least start with a pilot by choosing select groups and uh, build that confidence that you can go ahead and turn this on. Mistake number four is going to take the system preferred multi-factor authentication and really level it up. And this is where we start to use authentication strengths. If system preferred multi-factor authentication just relies on the user having opted in and then choosing the most secure MFA that's available to them, authentication strengths coupled with conditional access, that is going to allow us to force specific types of MFA. So. For that, where do we need to head? We're going to go in the same authentication methods page, and I'm going to click this option here for authentication strings. We'll jump in there. And now that we're in there, you'll see a few things in my tenant. First off, you'll see I've got some custom ones. They might not be there for you if you're following along, but you will see these built-in ones. And the premise of authentication strings in Intra ID is that not all types of MFA are created equal, right? On our channel, We've got some great videos that you should check out with regards to MFA bypasses and temporary access passes, man in the middle and adversary in the middle type stuff. We know through those processes that, for example, FIDO2 keys, they're just generically speaking, plain better than SMS or authenticator based MFA. Authentication strength allows us to target and craft specific types of MFA scenarios. So for example, uh, I have a custom authentication strengths here that I've called Windows Low for Business. And it basically says you have to use Windows Low for Business or Temporary Access Pass. And check out our video on Temporary Access Passes to understand the logic there. Similarly, we could do one for 502, aka passkeys. We then couple that with a conditional access policy. So we'll head to Policies, and I'll just craft one from the start here. Uh, I've got a few baselines there. Uh, let me know in the comments if you're interested in a more deep dive into conditional access design, because I think that might be interesting for a few folks. Anywho, I'll head to grant and you'll see here, I get these options. I get require multi-factor authentication or I got require authentication strengths. And actually if I choose require multi-factor authentication, it kind of nudges me towards requiring authentication strength. And the reason for that is this just means any type of MFA that I'm allowed to use. So that could be uh, text MFA, voice MFA, and so on. If I choose require authentication strength, I saying, based on the conditions that I specify in this conditional access policy, I must satisfy this type of authentication strength. So for example, for your most sensitive users, administrators, VIPs, folks who 
I guess you could say we're at an elevated risk of phishing attacks, things like that. You would reasonably want to choose phish resistant authentication, and you will simply not allow them access to those target resources unless they satisfy that. So it's just giving you more control and allowing you to really approach the reality that NFA is not a one size fits all thing and craft it to your specific needs. Take number five, our final mistake that we're going to cover for MFA is uh, not leveraging something called cross-tenant access settings. For that, we are going to head, where are we going to head for that? I get lost in the intra admin center so easily. We're going to head to external identities. We're going to head to cross-tenant access settings. Guard my changes in that policy, don't need them. Uh, we'll make this window a little bit tidier. Let's slow that. So there we go. Boom. Whole bunch of stuff here. Uh, we'll focus on the default settings for now. Everything I'm about to show you, you can specify per tenant, so other tenants that you work with. Uh, but we'll just work with the default settings for now on the assumption that you can tune that if you want to. And I'm going to edit my inbound defaults. Uh, let's head to settings. And here we go. The core of common mistake number five is not leveraging trusting multi factor authentication from other tenants. So if we think about Entra, all these different tenants, and they can be federated with something called Entra B2B, where we have guest users joining our tenant. The default way that that works, if I require my guests to do MFA, is that they'll be forced to register for MFA once more when they become a guest in my tenant. That means going into the Authenticator app and having another entry in that list of authentications. If you're someone like myself who works with a lot of other B2B organizations that can get, that list can get quite painful to manage. If we go in here and we choose trust multi-factor authentication from other Microsoft tenants, we don't need to do that. And the reason for that is when I'm a guest in a tenant, it can rely on the MFA in my home tenant. And that's kind of intuitive, right? Frankly, if this was on by default, since day one of Entra or Azure AD, you probably would never turn it off because you're just like, that's the intuitive behavior. So number one, you're going to make life easier. Number two, maybe the larger reason for enabling this is some authentication methods can only be registered in the home tenant. Specifically, fish resistant like pass keys and 502 security keys, we can only register them in the tenant where I'm a full member, so my home tenant. That means if you want to enforce something like a pass key and fish resistant authentication on guest users, you will have no choice but to trust the MFA from their home tenant because that's the only place they can register that. They cannot register that FIDO2 security key in your tenant as a guest. So this is, you know, a little bit of a win-win. Hopefully that doesn't come back to bite me and security researchers discover some kind of flaw in it. But I would say on the whole, this is a good, uh, a good quality of life improvement with some security benefits there as well. So that's the five common mistakes about Entra ID MFA. So if you like this video, we got a ton more common mistakes in Microsoft 365 on our Threatscape YouTube channel. So check those out.